So welcome to Self-Help and the 2021 Holidays, Managing Stress During the Winter Season in Pandemic Times. I'm thrilled to be co-facilitating this presentation with Ragini Lal, um, an amazing colleague from NAMI, the National Association of Mental Illness, California Community Engagement Manager. NAMI California is one of the um, partner agencies in the CARE-TA Center. So the Care TA Center is funded through the Department of Healthcare Services, and we are administered through the Center for Applied Research Solutions. What we are about to say here does not necessarily represent anyone's opinions other than our own, though we are very grateful for the funding and the institutional support. We don't anticipate any challenges, but should there be any issues with security, please know that we are in the background working to make this a safe place for everyone. And in the event that we were um, having any interruptions that we could not control from the backside, we would close down the Zoom room and send you an email for a new link to join a new Zoom room. So what is CARE? CARE is, as I said, the Crisis and Recovery Enhancement TA Center. We provide training and technical assistance to the 58 MHSA Mental Health Services Act funded counties and two city jurisdictions in the state of California specifically regarding crisis continuum of care and justice diversion. We focus on evidence-based practices, culturally defined, community defined, and culturally responsive practices. As I mentioned, we have several partner agencies, one of whom is the National Alliance of Mental Illness NAMI California chapter. We also partner with Recovery International RI, C4 Innovations, the Research and Action Center at Impact Justice, and Stanford Sierra Youth and Families. We provide a variety of types of training and technical assistance to support the crisis continuum of care and justice diversion in the state of California. In addition to webinars like today, we also provide learning collaboratives and cohort coaching sessions. And we have an annual conference that's coming up at the end of the year. We hope you'll join us. We provide on our website a variety of resources as well, including a resource library, we have a newsletter, and you can request training and technical assistance at no cost on our Care TA Center website. One of the resources that we think might be especially of interest to you on our website is the California County Crisis Continuum Asset Map. When I say that our goal is to support crisis continuum of care in California, what this means is we are striving to support people who experience behavioral health crises like suicide, overdose, interpersonal and inter intimate violence. We want to support people to recover from those crises in the community, outside of emergency rooms, psychiatric hospitals, and certainly outside of jails and prisons. We know that people tend to recover most quickly from behavioral health crises when they're in the community. In order to help people to recover in the community, it's important to know, is there a local mobile crisis unit in your county? Is there a local crisis line or warm line that you can call? Is there a local behavioral health uh, psych brief psychiatric stabilization unit? places that people can go and get immediate support in the community to recover from crisis so they don't have to go to emergency rooms where quite frankly, people tend to be exposed to a lot of extra stress in emergency rooms, right? This is where people are coming in with heart attacks and all sorts of different kinds of physical health crises. There's a lot going on in emergency rooms, not typically the kind of place where people are able to relax and unwind and slow down from a crisis. Same of course is true in jails and prisons. So this California County Crisis Continuum Asset Map is a place that you can go to find out what are those local behavioral health and justice diversion crisis continuum of care resources in your county. You can search on the right-hand side by your county and by a variety of different kinds of services. Like you can look at mobile crisis units or peer services, recovery supports, and so on. It's really exciting for me to be here with my esteemed colleague, Ragini Lal. Um, we are both going to introduce ourselves for just a moment here. So I'll just um, share with you briefly about myself. I am a licensed social worker by profession. 
I have been with the CARE TA Center since its inception, and my background really focuses on suicide prevention and working with diverse communities, LGBTQ folks, people of color, um, and people who are living with mental health challenges. My name is Ragni Lal. I'm the Community Engagement Manager in NAMI, California. Um, I've been with NAMI, California for a little over two and a half years. Um, so I'm still a bit new um, in the non California world and the nonprofit world, but a lot of my background is in um, crisis care work as uh, well as I'm currently a student in getting my master's in mental health clinical counseling. Um, and uh, my future work hopefully is to work with diverse communities and, um, and especially in the immigrant communities. So yeah, that's me. So as I was just sharing, we're going to be bringing together these two worlds of disaster crisis response and behavioral health crisis continuum of care. After we bring those two worlds together, we're going to talk about holiday moods, the good, the bad, and the reality of 2021. We're going to talk about some stressors that are specific to California. And then we're going to get into feeling it all and adapting to pandemic times. As we'll see, there is significant burnout in the behavioral health workforce. In order for us to support crisis continuum of care from a systemic level, we have to think about the wellness of our own workforce. And so that's where we get into some of this information about how our healthcare workers are doing. But also, our healthcare providers are providing services to people who are living through the pandemic and the wildfires and the megastorms and everything else that's going on. And so we're here today to provide some resources that can help everyone, the workforce and the people that we serve, get through the holidays as best as possible. We're going to conclude with some self-help and socially distanced mental health support resources, and then importantly, end with situational crisis counselor program, talking about COVID-19 and fire emergency response resources from CalHOPE, and as well as NAMI. This, um, line that Ragini was just mentioning is another huge resource that's available to the state of California. And so that's what we're doing today is to share resources across our community. One of the, thing that I, one of the things that I've heard from Ragini and others who work in the CalHOPE program is this idea that they're receiving questions that relate to emergency basic needs like housing or food. And there are also questions that have to do with behavioral health crises. And so there's an opportunity for us to be sharing resources across these two worlds. So it's important to start off by recognizing that when we say holidays in 2021, that there are at least 29 holidays that fall between November 1st and January 15th as observed by the seven major religions around the world. Hanukkah, which is an eight day celebration of the second temple in Jerusalem following the Maccabean revolt, this was around when an oil for one night lighted, lit the lamp for eight nights straight. And so now today there are nightly lightings of menorahs. There are also special foods and games and songs and familial and community celebrations that follow those eight nights. Kwanzaa is a seven day US celebration regarding the African first fruit harvest. These celebrations involve large meals, drumming, poetry, dance, and storytelling. You might have also heard of Boxing Day. In the United Kingdom, Boxing Day was a day of tithing when uh, alms were taken and distributed and servants were celebrated Christmas with their families. This is actually celebrated today in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, and the Bahamas. Amisoka is the New Year's Eve. It's the second most important, important day in Japanese tradition. Families gather to share final meal of the year. Toshikoshi soba or Toshikoshi udon are long noodles that cross over from one year to the next. So we wanna start off talking a little bit about two common aspects of a mood and things that impact moods during the holiday period. So the first is seasonal affective disorder. Seasonal affective disorder is an actual diagnosis in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It actually has to do with chemical changes in the body that relate to shorter days um, with less sunlight. And so some of the types of treatment are actually getting a light box and being exposed to light. 
Um, there are also antidepressants that some people will take for seasonal affective disorder. You might be familiar that one of the ways that you differentiate in a diagnostic perspective between seasonal affective disorder and what's referred to as holiday blues or holiday syndrome is that seasonal affective disorder tends to come up year after year around the same period of time and for the same length of time. So it's typically for several months period. Differently, holiday blues are also referred to as holiday syndrome. This is not a DSM diagnosis. This is rather something that has more to do with anticipation and expectations of holidays and reaction to what has happened in the past. It's not on a chemical basis. So we would not uh, diagnose and treat with a light box or antidepressants. Instead, the holiday blues are described as um, anticipating the tasks of the holiday season becoming fatigued by its demanding activities or engaging in bittersweet memories of distant holidays. For some of us, this can include feelings of fatigue, loneliness, unrealistic expectations, reflections on times past and loved ones who are no longer living. For many of us, holiday cheer can amplify that sense of loneliness or hopelessness. As Rogany was saying, going into department stores and just constantly being barraged with holiday music, especially if it's all Christmas music and the holidays that you celebrate are other than Christmas. It can feel very alienating to only have messages around Christmas time. Um, other people will experience anxiety or gloom, gloominess. Um, which is caused by unavoidable stress, exhaustion, and frustration that can come with preparing for the holidays. This is especially important for us to consider with older adults. It turns out research shows that lonely older adults are frequently hesitant to reach out for help because they might fear forced institutionalization or other losses of control in their lives. And so this is really important. Loring et al. Um, writes that grief and bereavement were the primary themes of the calls for older adults who actually did reach out for help in crisis lines. And that trained professionals and supervised students um, staffed the phone bank and provided services such as responsive listening and community referrals. So it's a good reminder that there are particular parts of our community based on age that will have different kinds of reactions. Similarly, children can experience the holidays as very stressful and confusing. Family plans and celebrations may be complicated by divorce, separation, or remarriage. We think especially about children who, has one or, who have one or more parent in the US military who are serving overseas, or children these years who have lost a parent to COVID. It can be really difficult to experience that separation and the holidays can bring up a sense of that intact, uh, of not having an in, quote unquote intact family. A little bit later on, we're gonna talk about some strategies that we can use to help youth and children and young adults get through these challenges. The flip side of this is what's referred to as holiday euphoria. So this is a pre-holiday effect that's been a well-documented phenomenon, especially researched in financial markets. And this is when people tend right before the holidays to start to act in really erratic ways. They spend too much or they act in ways that are very impulsive. What we see is that after the holidays, then there's a rebound effect. Um, and what's also really interesting to note is that unlike maybe some of the stereotypes that, oh, there's gonna be an increase in suicidality during the holidays, we don't actually see that. What we see is an increase in substance use, but we actually see a decrease in suicidal behavior and a decrease in people showing up in emergency rooms and calling crisis lines with suicidal ideation. This research is all prior to 2020. So, you know, to the extent to which the pandemic might be shifting this, that would be an important question. But generally speaking, during the holidays themselves, we see a reduction in suicidality. It's right after the holidays that there's again another rebound effect where we tend to see more of the behavioral health crises escalating to that level. So I want to start off by showing you a short video. Um, this information is heavy um, and as we'll find out later, we can really help ourselves by doing things like engaging in connection with others and also allowing ourselves to laugh and and um, connect the things that actually do elevate our mood. And I see Ayana put into the chat box um, a number of crisis lines. Thank you so much for doing that. I'm gonna invite uh, 
Stephen, to pr please bring up our first video. This is from Saturday Night Live. And the skit is called Best Christmas Ever. And we're gonna turn off the skit before it gets to the political side of the skit. But I wonder how many of you might be able to resonate with this. Research tells us that the majority of people tend to overestimate how great the holidays are gonna be or underestimate to the extent where they expect that they're gonna be horrible. And the reality is actually somewhere in the middle. But because of the pressure to um, make for the perfect holidays, um, that can actually, that sense of pressure that we put on ourselves and one another is actually what can lead to some distress. You can get the, the sense of this. The reason why this skit obviously is so funny, and we'll bring up the slides again, please, is because we all, even to the people that we're sitting right next to, are under pressure to have these perfect holidays. And really that requires so much work. Yeah, so there's some things that we get, you know, that we think about during the holidays and especially the clients that we work with. A lot of it might be, of course, COVID-19 related, just given the current, um, you know, state of the, you know, world. <laughs> and then I was going to say state, but it's the world. Um, and then there's also housing. Housing is, you know, in California, really huge um, issue right now and stuff. And, and during the holidays, it can get really rough. It's hard for families to afford housing and gifts for their children and their family members and loved ones. Just um, SUD, substance abuse disorders, um, they're usually calling in to receive support like support groups or how they're able to reach um, medical professionals to get medications. Of course, there's burnout, there's caregiver burnout, which is family members and loved ones needing support um, because it is pretty exhausting to really keep up making sure all your family members are happy um, and for parents as well. And then there's professional burnout where professionals are also asking for support groups for healthcare and um, mental health and behavioral health care. Um, and then also continuing education to help refresh their passion and you know how to help their clients like some of you are here today. And then there's insurance. Insurance is always, you know, there's like that time in, of the year where you can like really um, edit how your insurance um, will be for the rest of the year. And then um, there's a large number of calls on how to get help to even file them. And it's confusing. It's a complicated system to work through. And, um, you know, there's paperwork and all that. And then and then there's navigating care for self and for their loved ones. So navigation, again, through um, finding the right therapist for your loved one, finding the right support group for yourself, feeling safe. Who do you call? Where do you go? Do you just, you know, it? what if you don't have insurance? But, so navigating care is like a huge one. And then navigating the pressure of holiday season comes up a lot during the call um, where they're trying to find finances and keep the holiday spirit for themselves and, and um, for their loved ones. And then um, a lot of family and peer support groups that we offer from NAMI as well. That's a pretty common call that we get, which help with a lot of the above issues from that I just mentioned. There are many things that can um, cause challenges during the holidays. And as you heard me mention before, some of the research that talks about grief. So during the holidays, it can be really helpful, especially if you're a provider, um, both for yourself and for the folks that you work with, to check out some of this Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Uh, it's a SAMHSA-funded national um, group of, of training and technical assistance centers. In 2020, they did this really wonderful MHTTC Grief Sensitivity Virtual, Grief Sensitivity Virtual Learning Institute. And if you were to select this link here, you could access a number of no cost, 24 hours a day available recordings of this conference. Um, I think it's really important to talk about that while the holidays are lauded as celebrations, for many people, the losses um, that we've experienced in our lives are felt acutely. It is important to grieve family, friends, and clients who have died, and to mark the loss of jobs, milestones, of our children like graduations and communal gatherings like weddings, baptisms, bar mitzvahs and funerals. For many of us in 2020 and 2021, those typical milestones in life had to be postponed or changed because of the pandemic. The Mental Health America says in an um, article entitled Preparing for the Holidays During COVID-19, that if you are missing a loved one, 
think of ways to honor them during the festivities. If you've lost a job or had to drop out of school, take the time to recognize the challenges that came with that. Even if you haven't lost anything concrete, we've all lost our sense of normalcy in the last two years. And that ambiguous loss can really take a toll on us. And it's important to remember that grieving is a process. It involves periods of sorrow, numbness, guilt, and anger. And crying is actually particularly important during times of grieving. And as I was talking about this ambiguous loss, so this is the sense that there's just something is not quite right. If we step back and we look at California just in the last year alone, my gosh, look at how many wildfires we've experienced. There have been repeated power outages. Most recently, there have been megastorms with these atmospheric rivers and floods. And then, of course, the COVID-19 rates in California, both the infections and the deaths. And I just want to take a moment and honor all of us who have lost family members in the last two years with COVID. CalHOPE is a program. Um, it, it delivers crisis support for communities impacted by um, disasters such as COVID and wildfire. It is a crisis counseling assistant and training program and is funded by FEMA, which is a federal emergency uh, management agency. And it's also run by California Department of Healthcare Services, who have worked with multiple partners such as NAMI California um, to um, build a community of resiliency and help people recover through free outreach, crisis uh, counseling, and even support services. Um, I have the links up on um, the slide, and then I'll go ahead and after the slide, put them into the chat as well. Um, and it's, uh, they also have CalHOPE connect and it offers safe, secure, and culturally sensitive emotional support for all Californians through live chat and support groups. And then they also have a specific CalHOPE red line for urban Indian health. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's ran by California Consortium, Consortium for Urban Indian Health. Um, and it also, also offers phone chat and video chat service to the urban Indian and tribal populations. So that's a pretty general idea of what CalHOPE is in general. But we have live trained um, peer specialists um, count, uh, who are uh, CalHOPE counselors that actually will get on the phone with you. We'll have multiple calls and sessions with you one on one. They even offer support groups and they also offer, you know, all, all types of groups. They have them together to trainings. They do quite a lot of uh, different work alone in the in the program. Um, and it's mainly to offer support, whether it is for COVID or wildfire reasons, but it's also for any other reasons, like I said, you know, and Eliana's probably mentioned as well, that it all overlaps. Um, you know, there's, it's just a domino effect. It's a lot that's happening right now. So um, they offer a lot of uh, support in multiple ways. Um, and they're very versatile and, and providing the support. And here are some resources that I'd like to offer. Um, there's quite a lot, as you can see. Um, there's the CCB Council Wildfire Emergency. Um, it's a resource guide, and this is for this is one one that's been actually specifically made by our wildfire um, Cal Hope counselors, and it is a PDF, and I'll also input that into chat. Um, and then there's the County Mental Health Service information. Um, that one has um, a lot of important resources by county, and it's mainly like behavioral health care services. Um, and then also has like education and awareness program as well as suicide prevention. Um, and then there's a 2021 uh, wildfire siege. And that is, um, it's in the government website, the California government website, and it um, provides you all the programs that give you disaster assistance, like to financial and um, and just basic needs. And then especially in areas that are most impacted, um, and then there is the VA mobile app, and it's an app that was designed to assist responders um, to provide per a psychological first aid to adults, families, and children um, as part of an organized response effort. And um, they're, matched, they're matched to specific concerns and needs of survivors and tips, and then they actually go out and provide assistance. Um, for um, in individuals who are in, in need of crisis. And then there is also the um, Cal, Wild, uh, Cal Fire Wildfire app. 
Um, it kind of gives you just a better idea of where there are wildfires happening, how do you, what tools you'll need to protect yourself, um, safety um, um, tools and just tips and strategies. And then um, that's, I think would be important for anyone who's in the in specialized areas that have more increased wildfires. Um, and has like, it's pretty updated as well. Um, and then there's the AP guide on navigating holidays with COVID-19 affected finances. Um, so this is specifically, like I said before, financial help has been, it's stressful to go through COVID and the holidays. I mean, a lot of, you know, in the finance world, a lot of money spent from um, October to like, I think February. Um, and it's just stressful for your family and for yourselves and for the clients that you work with. Um, and it gives you basically a, like a strategy, like a tip, and it's an article that will help you um, kind of create like a plan on like how to spend and like when to go shopping and, you know, um, don't be afraid to not have to shop and just kind of like help you kind of guide you through this process. Um, and then there's also the California Surgeon General's Playbook. It's a stress relief during COVID-19. Um, that one was pretty well heard about. It's a pretty large article. Um, and it just, again, also gives you like the importance of stress management during this time. Just kind of like how to be aware of your own stress, how to make a plan. Um, and then just kind of tips that you can do to kind of add in just within your 24 hours. Um, and then the next thing is the uh, NAM California information on PTSD with resources for treatment. Um, I feel like, you know, I've had experiences and, and, and saw that in the polling, some other people have experiences where you have gone through some uh, grief or loss uh, during this time in the holidays and the bad memories associated with holidays can come up each year and, you know, and shows up in, you know, ways of trauma. So this it provides a lot of information on what PTSD looks like. Maybe you can read it and maybe you're recognizing some symptoms for yourself and maybe um, get help for your yourself, your family and your clients. And then there's also the non California wildfire information resources among the other wildfire um, information I give, um, Nama California kind of just sums it up on their uh, website if you just want to have a quick go to to kind of get started on getting support that way. And then there's the CDC coping with disaster or trauma, a traumatic event. Um, again, similar to just, you know, learning about um, disasters that are happening and then what, um, how to cope from the uh, traumatic event, like just post um, trauma. And then there's the disaster distress helpline as well. And then they're able to have, they have their multiple resources and warm handoffs that they can give to help you navigate through disasters. So that was quite a lot, but I hope that you are um, um, able to utilize some of these resources for yourself and your clients. Thank you so much, Ragini. I really appreciate that. Um, and the next slide is exactly why those resources are so important. Like you said, Ragini, for ourselves and for the people that we work with. Recent um, study just came out from the American Medical Association in the Lancet um, that was looking at 20,000 healthcare providers across the United States. They interviewed people from 42 healthcare organizations to assess workers' stress. And as you can see here, it was everyone from doctors to nurses to other people who work in healthcare facilities, both inpatient and outpatient in the community. 61% of respondents said that they were ex experiencing fear regarding exposure to themselves from COVID or to their families based on the work that they were doing. 38% De described feeling anxiety or depression. 43% described themselves as experiencing overload from work and 49% described feeling, feelings of burnout. And I'm sure everyone has probably heard about the great resignation. So many people are leaving their jobs because especially in the healthcare profession, people are burned out. There's compassion fatigue, the experiences of carrying this incredible weight and burden are significant. But it's not just from COVID-19, it's also from the public that there are um, politicized viewpoints out in the world about things like wearing masks and using PPE. And that's really difficult and it wears on healthcare providers. There's familial stress for those of us who have children 
last year when all of the schools closed down, many of us were having to juggle not only our own work, if we were lucky enough to be able to work remotely, but also caring for our children and supporting them in their virtual classrooms. Of course, if we have elderly family members or other people who require um, high levels of care, then we are also providing care in those levels as well. And then there are, of course, the situational stressors like the natural disasters that we were just talking about. And from the great resignation, there's endemic um, understaffing across our systems. So when we think about then this moment when we're trying to gear ourselves up for creating holidays for our families and for maybe other people in the community and ourselves, it can be really stressful as we talked about before because we have expectations that we have to create the perfect holiday. Um, I have found that this work by Priya Parker regarding the art of gathering, how we meet and why it matters is profoundly helpful. Um, she's in, she wrote a book about this. She was also interviewed by Brene Brown on this podcast called Unlocking Us. And some of the main pieces that she talks about are that our successful gatherings really focus first and foremost on why we are connecting to each other. So she says that a gathering is, I quote, a conscious bringing together people for a reason, shaping the way we feel, the way we think and the way we make sense of the world. It's about coming together for a purpose, to fill a need. If we come together for the purpose of creating a quote unquote perfect holiday, then we can end up like that Saturday Night Live skit. If instead we come together for the purpose of reconnecting with family or friends or other loved ones, how might that environment look differently? Maybe it's not about creating the perfect spread of food with so many different dishes and the perfect decorations. Maybe it's instead having the time to sit down and to make eye contact with each other and actually connect as human beings. Priya Parker said, but here's the great paradox of gathering. There are so many good reasons for coming together that often we don't precisely know why we're even doing it. She says, you're not alone if you skip the first step of just first asking, why are we gathering together? So whether it's over Zoom or whether it's in person, first asking ourselves. You might know a little bit about the history of barn raising, right? So this was a party that people would have. They would bring people together to literally raise a barn. Why? Because when you build a barn, you need more than one person. You can't set up four different posts with only one person, you literally need multiple people to raise the barn up. Similarly, baby showers, the original idea of baby showers in this country and other parts of the world were to, for people to gather together to share resources with oftentimes a young couple to help them get started and to share resources for the baby or for the family. It's really important that we con consider the contextual historical um, predecessors that we have. In the United States, there was a time during World War II from 1941 to 1943 where there were food rations in this country, where there were restrictions on travel. In fact, gasoline and tire rationing meant that people could not travel to the next town over to visit family members. And the food rations, people were discouraged from going above and beyond to create these huge meals and oftentimes couldn't because of the food rations. Instead, people were encouraged to make meals and bring them to veterans and to others who were in the community who were um, otherwise left out. In fact, that year there was not even a Macy's Thanksgiving parade because they were at a lot loss of gasoline and as I said, tires and other things that were necessary for this major parade. So what did they do instead? We saw a lot of articles that year about how to improvise and make holiday meals with ration food. That reminds me of this last year as we started to step back and go, well, how do we use Zoom? Or how do we use phone calls? Or how do we visit that elderly family member in a skilled nursing facility and wave to them from the outside? The main point of this is about adapting to the holidays. And I'm gonna show you, this is a picture of COVID man. My son, seven years old last year, made this decoration. He said, this is COVID man because he's wearing a mask. 
And it reminded me how the minds of children oftentimes are really good at adapting. We brought out the art supplies and we decided to make decorations for our Christmas tree. And this is what he came up with because it was what was real in his life at that moment. And so I invite us to think about all of our major holidays and think about what is the original message behind these celebrations. For Kwanzaa, for example, a holiday of strength and resilience. It's really about gathering to relate to the past, to think about the stories of our su success and our survival and our resilience and how that might makes sense now and into the future. It's about understanding the present and preparing for the future. Hanukkah is about shining a light of hope out of the darkness. In all of our major holidays, there probably is some message like this that if we think about it, we can adapt to our current circumstances. So talking about this idea, how do we adapt? How do we adapt with the technology that is available to us? So this slide has a variety of resources of activities that you can play if you happen to be socially distanced. Um, for whatever reasons, from family or friends, activities that you can play online. There are games you can play in a Zoom room here. And there are even these incredible things like jib jab videos. I don't know if you've seen this before, but you can upload photos of yourself and others and it, they populate into these pre-made music videos. Some of them are quite funny. Some of them are a little bit risque. So to keep my job here, I'll just say, I encourage you to look at the funny ones. There's also portable North Pole. If Christmas is something that you celebrate in your family, I'll have to speak quietly here so my eight-year-old doesn't hear. But every year I order through Portable North Pole a video where I upload pictures of my son and he gets a video from Santa. And he literally to this day still thinks that Santa sends him a video message every year. It's amazing. Here's the good news. I'm a social worker, so you're gonna get a strengths-based perspective from me. In 2021, we did not have this in 2020. A new planning tool that has just come out. If you clicked on this link, this would take you to a, a a website where you can put in your zip code and the number of people that you're going to be gathering with and it will literally tell you based on local COVID data what your risk might be of gathering with x number of people. So I looked at my family is going to be gathering in the Santa Rosa area and I think there might be about 10 people there and when I looked it up on today's data this morning there's about a five percent chance that somebody would show up at that party who might be infected with COVID right now. So this is a really interesting resource that was not available in the past. And this is helpful for us to do our own risk assessment and for our family members, but also for the clients that we work with. If you happen to be working with somebody who's living with AIDS related illnesses or um, other kinds of illnesses that put them at higher risk of COVID, then they might be especially keen to figure out what the risks might be for themselves. It's important to think about boundary setting. So, if you decide to go to a gathering with others or you decide to stay home, either way, it's helpful to have language like, I'm sorry, but I'm not having people over right now. Or can you please wear a mask while providing your service? Or you were just on vacation. I don't feel comfortable seeing you right now. Or I've decided to put my child in daycare because that's what's best for my family. If we prepare some of these statements ahead of time, it can reduce the overwhelming stress that can come up when we're face-to-face -face in social situations that we otherwise wouldn't have responded to in this way. Helping to ease um, our realistic expectations is to think about everything from if we decide to have a gathering with others, how many meals we're, or how many dishes we're gonna make. Maybe in the past, if I was gonna have all of my family over, I would have made a five course meal. Maybe this year I'll make one dish and I'll ask everyone to bring their favorite dishes as well. So I'm really um, trying to minimize the amount of stress for everybody. Additionally, we can think about making gifts this year or delivering items. And these are very class-based, sorry, I have to let the cat out because he's screaming in the background, sorry about that. Um, you know, but thinking about what was, what the, the ways that we celebrated the holidays in the past do not have to be the ways that we do them this year. And I would invite you to think back to the little um, image that my son made for the tree and think about what can we do this year that's meaningful for us and others with what we already have around. I think it's especially important for us to think about trauma-informed business practices. So in our team, for example, we talk about starting meetings um, 
a little bit after the hour or and ending them a little bit before the hour ends so that we can have a little bit of human time is what we call it in between our Zoom meetings. We also check in with each other and actually ask, how are you doing? And what might you be experiencing in the area that you live in that would affect our ability to connect via Zoom? Or is it better for us to have a phone call today? Maybe you live in an area where there were rolling blackouts and it's better to connect by phone than over computer. Additionally, we created a Microsoft Teams channel at the beginning of the pandemic for parents to talk about the kinds of stressors that we were experiencing. And we shifted our meeting time to be after 9, 9 a.m. and before 2 p.m., those are the hours when people were typically having to get their kids onto Zoom meetings in virtual school as well. Additionally, we encourage the idea of mindful closeness. So this is about reminding ourselves and others why we are coming together in, in the first place. And this goes back to Priya Parker's idea that we get together with a real intention of why we're connecting, not just because it's what happens in Hollywood movies or Hallmark films. But what is the intention? And we want to make sure that we have scheduled downtime for ourselves. It can be very easy to have this exuberance, right? People have been vacationing with a vengeance, I think is what people were saying over the summer. They were engaging in so much vacationing to make up for lost time, right? And we might have a tendency to do that for the holidays as well, but that downtime is really important between events. And instead of doom scrolling, we might consider scrolling online to find funny videos or see cute kittens or watch comedians instead. And that importantly, gratitude practice is really helpful as well. So this would be setting time aside every day to just reflect on what was good today. What am I grateful for? Um, it's really helpful to volunteer, but not to overcommit. Thank you, Eliana. So here are some uh, links on and, and just a lot of resources on self-care. Um, as we talk about, you know, self-care, I think the hardest thing about self-care is how to get started and, you know, why you even struggle with being consistent about self-care. I think that's always like the hardest part um, for me personally. And, and then what I've seen in a lot of um, people I've worked with is like self-care sounds great. And it sounds like it sounds like it's something that everyone wants to do all the time. But but then where do, you, where do you go if you have such a busy life? I mean, I think the first thing I'll hear is like, oh, when I ask, like, do you do self-care? And a lot of folks are like, yeah, but, and then they give me a lot of reasons for why they don't do self-care and why it's so difficult. Not that that's a bad thing. It, all of it's true. You do have a life. You have everything that you're going through. And then I'm sure a lot of the clients you work with will probably say something similar. So I guess my biggest thing on these uh, resources is the first one you should probably start off with is why you struggle with self-care and how to learn and to take care of yourself and how self-care isn't exactly like giving yourself a bath or making, you know, going, doing something extravagant. Sometimes it could just be, you know, looking away from the screen for longer than five minutes. Um, maybe it's not just to take your dog out or to pay attention to your kid. Maybe it is to just, you know, walk away and not respond to that email right now you know and stuff because when I get an email my mind just jumps to that and I want to quickly respond it but now I give myself literally like you know the time to actually be like okay this is when I'll go to my email because emails are like text messages where you have to respond immediately unless it is very important or the project you're working on that day but something like that. Um, so for me, self-care really starts for certain little places. And then maybe when you start kind of building a momentum, it's like working out, which working out is also a form of self-care for some folks. And why movement is so important in mental health, that's also a resource that's listed on the slide. Um, and then it's like working out, you got to build yourself a momentum. So that's my biggest tip for self-care. And here are all the resources that NAMI California and other agencies have to offer. So appreciate, Ragini, that you started off just normalizing that it's hard for many of us to engage in self-care. For those of us who are care providers, whether it's because we are peer specialists or we are behavioral health clinicians or we are administrators in behavioral health programs or we're parents or we're uh, adult children of parents that need caring for so many of us, it is in who we are to be providing for others. And so to make that shift can really be hard for us. 
I think also for a number of women of color in particular and women in general as well, there are societal expectations that are explicit or implicit value really is about how we care for other people. And so for some of us, making that shift to caring for ourselves feels uncomfortable because it feels like we're violating some social norm or expectation about what we're supposed to do for our families or communities. Um, and I also will just say that hashtag here we go executive realness is that to care for ourselves means that we have to stop and check in where we might feel exhausted or where we might feel sad or disappointed or angry or hurt. And that can be scary. And I think for so many of us, we've survived to this point in 2021 because we've been compartmentalizing, right? We've been saying, okay, I'm gonna put on um, you know, the guardrails here and just focus on this thing that's in front of me to get through this otherwise unconscionably difficult world that we're living in right now, where you turn on the news and every day it seems like there's something really intense that's happening in the country or in the world. And that's overwhelming. And so our way of getting through all of this is to not let ourselves process what's actually happening for ourselves. So it can be scary to take down the guard a little bit and allow ourselves. I think what's amazing about, and we're just going to go to a break in, in just a few moments here, but one of the last points is to ask everyone, when was the last time you had a really good cry? I mean, really good. Like, just let yourself kind of like shake a little ugly cry, right? When like, you don't want anyone else to see you, as they say. Um, I'll be honest with you. I allowed myself to have a good ugly cry this weekend, and I learned something fascinating in that moment. The fascinating thing that I learned is mopping while ugly crying is a fabulous pairing of activities. Why? Because if you're crying while you're mopping, it's the tears are just falling down to the ground anyway, and you just keep mopping them away. I highly recommend also adding a little Adele or The Cure or whomever, you know, music that will really allow yourself to kind of open up and just let it out. It's helpful for us to do this because it helps to reset Ariella says this exactly. We feel released. Why? There are chemical things that happen inside of our bodies when we cry. Starting with the vagus nerve, right? When you cry and you really let it out, there is a reset that happens in our autonomic central nervous system. We release chemicals, feel good chemicals. So after we come back from the break, we're going to share a short video with you about how to release feel good chemicals in your brain naturally. Crying is one of those things that'll do it. So I just want to, right before we go to break, acknowledge that we've brought up a lot of real intensity here. We're having the conversation directly. We've got a lot of good stuff coming up that are about very concrete self-help skills to help us all get through the holidays and to help the clients that we serve as well. So this holiday stress management worksheet takes us through um, questions based off of what Priya Parker had shared about the meaning of gatherings and how to manage expectations. So this first question is, what do you expect of yourself during the holidays? For example, do you have expectations that you will make a family meal or you will receive gifts from, uh, from others or you will get gifts and give them to others? Or do you expect to visit family or to host family or friends? And then after you've written those things down, exhaust them all in your head, then come back and circle the things that can or have led to other people's disappointment or frustration or your own negative self-talk. And then ask yourself, when there have been negative reactions, is it because the expectations were unrealistic? And then cross out any expectations that are not realistic that you want to let go of. And this was a really freeing exercise for me um, personally in this last two years, especially with small children, because the expectation is I've got to make the perfect holiday for the kids. Sometimes kids are in bad moods and they get crabby and they don't want to open the presents or they don't like the meal that has spent so many hours making or what have you. And so it can be really helpful just cross out those things that are unrealistic expectations. Uh, would you scroll down, please, a little bit? So question number two, 
is what do you expect of other people during the holidays? Do you expect other people will be celebrating with you? Do you expect that they will express their love for you? Do you expect that they'll appreciate the gifts that you give them? Or do you expect that they will be giving you gifts? And then again, after you have an opportunity to write down all of the things that come to your mind, go back and circle those things that have led to your disappointment or frustration with others. And then go ahead and cross out any of that might not be realistic. I think especially with people who are living with um, long haulers COVID, this is something important to remember that some of the long hauler symptomology of COVID impact how we process emotions, impact how we process information. And so whether it's that somebody's living with long hauler COVID or they are living with depression or there might be financial challenges that they're not telling you about, there could be any number of reasons why people may not meet our own expectations. We'll go um, scroll down further, please. Question number three, what causes you stress during the holidays? And please place a level of stress for each item. And your choices are zero, no stress, to one, some stress, two, a fair amount of stress, and three, a lot of stress. And for each line, write down what level of stress you might experience from buying gifts, making a holiday meal, family dynamics, like family members who do not get along very well, or if there's a history of trauma or current abuse. Travel can be stressful, missing loved ones who are no longer in your life, feeling alone, or children's expectations or needs during the holiday. And there, there's a line, of course, for other as well. The next question is, is there anything you can change? Oh, it should say during the 2021 holidays to reduce the above stressors, like shopping online instead of going into the store or a gift exchange instead of buying gifts for everyone. In our family, we do what's called a white elephant gift. So everybody gets one gift and you wrap it up and put it in the middle and you don't assign it to everyone, anyone, but we all pull numbers and then you get it, grab a gift. And if you'd like somebody else's gift, better, get her, excuse me, better, you can exchange them. And it's pretty funny. We get laughing and this kind of stuff. If finances allow for it, ordering a pre-cooked meal instead of making meals, um, reducing time with certain family members who frankly <laughs> are more stressful than they are helpful, um, not traveling, or planning time for grieving. When do we actually plan time to grieve or to cry? Volunteering to help others, cooking and freezing food ahead of time. The fifth question, because strengths-based, what is the most joyful or enjoyable part of the holidays for you? And it, you might surprise yourself a little bit. Um, and we'll go down a little bit further, please. Question number six, if those enjoyable aspects of the holidays are impacted by COVID-19 or anything else like wildfires, maybe we have family members who are still evacuated from homes or maybe we are ourselves. Are there any adaptations that you can plan to access that enjoyment? For example, using Zoom or virtual family gaming or the Jib Jab app that I was telling you about. Next question, is there anyone for whom you are creating holiday events, activities, meals, or et cetera? If yes, to what extent do you feel pressure to make things perfect? Question number eight, what expectations of yourself can be set for a realistic holiday? So I can do more planning to rest, asking for help, or comedy scrolling instead of doom scrolling on a phone in the middle of the night, or I can do less of over committing, spending too much money, or trying to make the quote unquote perfect holiday. Number nine, what boundaries can be set for time health relationships that will reduce stress for you? And 10, where can you create breaks for, your, for just yourself? So you can do your own enjoyable activities. You can have your own downtime or like Ravani was talking about engaging in self-care. 11, when you look back, what will make this holiday season a success for you? What is most important to you? Is it spending time with family or watching your favorite holiday movies or eating a certain family recipe or maybe attending a religious service? Again, it could be things that are very different than what's in the Hallmark movies. Number 12, what five things are a fit for your go-to mood management activities? 
So it could be taking a walk outside, listening to calming music, watching a comedy, petting a cat, reading a book, stretching, etc. We'll scroll down further, please. And we're about to share some of these things with you. So there's some videos and podcasts that are here that you can listen to or check out that you might find helpful as well. We can feel both happy and excited and also sad and stressed fascinatingly at the same time. Some of these activities that you see on the slide can help us to move through intense feelings and especially contradictory feelings. I mentioned earlier the benefits of crying and I can't overstate this. Crying, did you know that crying actually detoxifies the body? It's a form of self, self soothing through resetting the parasympathetic nervous system. It reduces pain through release of endorphins, chemicals in the brain. It rallies support from early attachment, right? When a baby cries, typically people will come and attend to that, that baby. It helps in the grieving process and it helps to restore equilibrium. And you might think about it, we don't always cry just because we're sad. Sometimes we cry out of happiness, right? Or sometimes we cry if we've been really, really surprised too and like <gasps> shocked a little bit. It's the way that the body has to help us release intense feelings of a variety of kinds. Writing can be really helpful. And I know for some of us who are behavioral health providers we might be like, oh yeah, I tell clients to do this all the time. But when have we actually done it ourselves? To actually write it out. We know that narrative therapy benefits through meaning making, right? When we rewrite the meaning of the challenges that we've experienced or even the traumas that we might've experienced. There's a catharsis of expression and it helps us to identify feelings as well when we have to actually write it out. There's something that happens when we put it on a paper outside of ourselves that some kind, sometimes can help us actually identify the thing. So writing could include poetry. It could include writing lyrics, fiction, nonfiction, journaling, or jokes. Singing is really, really helpful as well. So whether we're talking about blues, gospel, Native American drumming and prayer, like we just saw in that video, there are so many ways that when we vocalize our feelings, it allows us to experience them more fully and it can allow us to have that crying come through or that laughter or whatever the feeling might be. And then dancing it out is really important. Again, it could be improvisational dance. It could be dancing at a powwow like we saw in that video. The main point is that emotional expression is necessary for so many of us in our day-to-day -day lives. We're given the message that we're not allowed to express emotions, especially if we're behavioral health providers. But I also want to acknowledge that emotional expression is a privilege, right? So if we look back to times, for example, of slavery in the United States, for people who were enslaved to have expressed emotion, fear, anger, deep sadness, that could have resulted in very, very dangerous and lethal outcomes, right? So there are many places, or even today in many types of jobs, if we are seen expressing emotion, assumptions will be made due to stigma that we're not able to do our jobs and we could lose our jobs. So there is a place where emotional expression isn't uh, in and of itself a privilege, but here's the good news. And this is really exciting. If you're able to carve out some space and time for yourself, there are many things that we can do naturally to release chemicals in our brains that help us to feel better. And so remember back to the beginning when I said there's a difference between seasonal affective disorder and what's called the holiday blues or holiday syndrome. Holiday blues, holiday syndrome are not a, they're not chemical basis. They have to do more with expectations and, and histories of losing people and grief. But we can shift those feelings a little bit by affecting our chemicals that are within our brain versus seasonal affective disorder is a deeper um, chemical experience that sometimes can require actual antidepressant medications or light therapy. Um, but this video, and we're gonna bring it up now, please, is how to hack into your happy chemicals. You may not have a money tree, but you can have a happiness tree. Hi, I'm Ty Nguyen, and today we're gonna talk about hacking into your happy chemicals. 
Dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins are the quartet responsible for your happiness, and there are ways to intentionally cause them to flow. Dopamine is released whenever you achieve a goal. Low levels of dopamine are linked with low self-esteem, self-doubt, low enthusiasm, and what causes us to procrastinate. So you can cause dopamine to be released by taking that big goal and breaking it up into smaller pieces, and each time you reach a milestone, going out and celebrating. They did some interesting studies on rats. Those with high levels of dopamine always worked harder to achieve a bigger goal and experience a bigger reward. Those with low levels always took the easy route and experienced a small reward. Also, there's typically a slump after you achieve a goal. There's a, a big time frame between your next experience of dopamine. And so to overcome that, set a new goal before your current goal is reached. That way it shortens the time frame between experiences of dopamine. Healthy levels of serotonin are experienced by people who feel as though they have significance and importance in their life when they have a deep sense of meaning. Antidepressants actually work by facilitating the release of serotonin. And so you can cause serotonin to flow through gratitude practices by reflecting on experiences and achievements, accomplishments in the past. The brain has difficulty telling the difference between what's imagined and what is real. And so during the gratitude practice, uh, you're causing your brain to release serotonin by bringing back these mental images of achievements and accomplishments. Oxytocin, otherwise known as the love hormone or the cuddle hormone, is a glue that strengthens relationships. And it's released between couples during orgasm. It's released by mothers in childbirth and during breastfeeding to strengthen that bond. Doctors say that you can facilitate the release of oxytocin through human touch, human interaction, creating intimate moments. And one great way is instead of going in for a handshake, just to give a hug. There's one doctor that recommends eight hugs a day, so you can try that and help you release more oxytocin. Endorphins are released in response to acute pain and stress. So runners, if you've ever experienced the runner's high or your second wind, that's your brain releasing endorphins, giving you that surge and that rush to keep moving forward. It acts in a similar way to morphine, actually, as an analgesic or sedative. Endorphins will, will help relieve that pain and you can help endorphins to flow um, through simply laughing. Laughing is been shown as a great tool for facilitating endorphin release. Even the anticipation of laughter will cause your brain to release endorphins. So bringing your sense of humor wherever you go to work, forwarding that funny email will help your brain release endorphins. There are also different foods and aromas that can help facilitate endorphin release. Dark chocolate has been shown as one and spicy food as well. So just have some dark chocolate at your table if you want an endorphin release. So you've heard me mention the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. And so what this is, is um, the parasympathetic nervous system are the organs in our body that work automatically, right? So our lungs breathe, our heart pumps. We don't think about them to make these things happen. They just do them on their own, right? When we were back as cave people and we were being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, uh, the brain had two reactions, fight or flight. Well, we now know that there's also fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. But essentially what happens is when we are faced with a very serious threat to our ability to survive, we go into an automatic process. And that automatic process does things happen automatically in our body to help us get through. So you might notice when you're in a stressful situation that your heart starts beating really fast. You might feel clammy in your hands or sweating. You might feel like you've got tunnel vision or even your auditory senses might become tunneled in. Why is this happening? It's because when we were having to run away from or serve fight off that saber toothed tiger, all of the blood in our extremities had to go into the center of our body. So that way, if the saber-toothed tiger got us, we were on a limb, we were less likely to bleed death. And we needed all the blood to be in the central part of our body so that we could run away if we had to or fight like heck. 
the tunnel of vision allows the brain to focus very quickly on, on how to get us out and how to survive. But in today's day, we're not really fighting saber toothed tigers, right? It may be that email that's coming in that causes a whole bunch of stress as Rogany was describing before, or it might be sitting in traffic, or it might be frankly turning on the evening news. And so there, we know from dialectical behavioral therapy that there are a variety of skills that we can use to help to reset the parasympathetic nervous system by supporting and strengthening the resilience of our vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is the central part of this parasympathetic nervous system. We can do things like changing temperature very quickly. Um, I will oftentimes with a baby that's crying and unconsolable, I'll take the baby outside. Sometimes a sudden change in temperature can really help. Or I'll have the older kid jump into a really cold bath or um, the swimming pool during the summer if we have access to a swimming pool. We will see in a moment here a video of a psychologist who shows us how to change your temperature very quickly with a dive reflex. What happens here is that all mammals' hearts begin to slow down below the resting point when we're exposed to really cold water. And this resets the parasympathetic nervous system so that we can have a different reaction to what's happening around us. And we'll show you a video to, to explain this in just a moment. Additionally, intense exercise can do this as well. You heard the gentleman speak about um, the release of the endorphins that can happen as well. Also paced breathing. If we take a longer inhale than exhale, if you do this for several minutes, it will uh, reset that parasympathetic nervous system as well. And what's interesting is that our breathing is the only part of the parasympathetic nervous system that we have control of. You can't think to yourself, I'm gonna slow my heart rate down. That doesn't work, but you can slow down your breathing. And what's interesting is when you slow down your breathing, it makes all of the other organs slow down as well. And then finally, progressive muscle relaxation. This can help to distract from racing thoughts. It's grounding. And especially if you can do it for 15 minutes or more, it really can help. So your progressive muscle relaxation means starting, you can start at the top of your head, you can start at your toes and go through each muscle group and contract and hold it and then slowly relax and be aware of how it feels differently each time you do it. So it will take just two seconds here to try something with me. So if you will, everyone sit down, if you're not, if you're standing, sit down, please. And think about your toes. We're gonna start off at your toes. And now curl your toes up as tight as you can. Tight, oh, keep holding them, keep holding them, keep holding them. Think about how does it feel right now? And then slowly relax your toes. Think about how does that feel right now? Let's do it one more time. Clench them up really tightly, your toes. Clench them, clench them, clench them. How does it feel? And then slowly relax them. If you were to continue doing this, eventually, if you haven't already, you start to feel kind of a warmth that comes over those muscle groups. And progressive muscle relaxation, you can then move up to your calves and to your thighs and your stomach and eventually your shoulders and your face as well. And make funny faces and hold them tightly and then relax them. All of that kind of progressive muscle relaxation will create that warm feeling. And it also is something to focus on to get the mind off of the racing thoughts that tend to be so stressful. This website, Now Matters Now, is one of the best suicide prevention resources that I've found to date online. I highly encourage people to check this out, to share it with clients. There are videos from a variety of people who have histories with suicide. Um, who talk about what they do now to get through recurring, intense, overwhelming feelings. Many of us have worked with people who have had multiple suicide attempts over their lifetimes, and it can be very, very frightening for us as providers um, because, of course, the risks are so high. So this is one of the videos on this website. Too much caffeine today and then an upsetting email and my heart rate is at 101 so I'm running a bath a cold bath and uh, I'm gonna slip myself into it and, and see you know, whether that works or not right now my hands are shaking 
and um, it's hard to think clearly. I'm working on t doing pace breathing, but it's so hard to do pace breathing when your anxiety is this high. It's a, such a cruel thing. I'm walking in right now, my heart rate's 111. Sitting down, oh God. Oh. Uh, I just turned the water to as cold as it would go. I'm, in, I'm up to my waist. My oh God. heart rate is at 102. Now I'm up to my chest bone. I'm up to my armpits and my neck. Oh. And up to my wrist. So everything is submerged except for my wrist. My heart right now is 98. I'm going to do some pace breathing. 96, 95, 94, 93, 92, 89, 88, 87, 86, 85, 84, 83, 82, oops, so 84. Stuck there. 84, all right, great. So I've been in here 83, 82, a couple minutes now. You now it's a little bit easier to do some pace breathing. So if you were to go to this website, there are a variety of other videos um, that also talk about dialectical behavioral therapy um, exercises that anyone can do. You don't have to be a trained mental health clinician to do them. Um, and it's everything from having a hobby um, to somebody says, get a cat, actually get a cat with, with health issues so that there's a cat that really, really needs some help, you know, that there are a variety of ways, paint a room, do any number of things that can help to distract from that moment when the feelings are so overwhelming because no feeling is final until the final feeling. Oh, it's really interesting that you're talking about the dive reflex um, video or like how well it works because uh, this year, Something me and my best friend uh, wanted to really try was um, just basically th essentially the same thing where in, in San Francisco, there's a bunch of them. Um, a lot of uh, cities and um, areas that have a higher API community have a bunch of these. But um, in San Francisco, we went to three different ones. There were Japanese hydrotherapy uh, spas, essentially, and then you would... Um, pretty intimate that's the best professional way I can put it is that you're intimate you are welcome to just be fully bare as yourself but you know I didn't do that and then so I just was um but the experience was that you go into the cold water and then you go into really hot water and then you go back to cold water and you go back to hot water um and then it's a few minutes of each um cold and to hot baths and I remember the first time it was yeah very difficult when you first try it but then when you got like I did it like I think three times um within an hour the first time and I literally like was about to fall asleep because mm -hmm. the stress just felt like it just left my body and it, I haven't felt like that in quite some time you know and then like I do I'm someone who does practice self-care often I'm someone who has been trying to do boundaries doing all the things that I need to do on a daily basis but trying that out and watching it like feeling my like the my physical body relax really helped like um, release those endorphins and then um, and really bring my mind into like a much more calmer space. I didn't want to go back home because it's a two hour drive back home. I was so tired only because it wasn't even tired because I was like exhausted. I was tired because I was relaxed. And that's a very rare thing um, to experience for a lot, of, a lot of individuals who have been high stress lately. So I highly, highly recommend doing the Japanese hydrotherapy um, like like dive reflex type baths where you do merge yourself into cold water, you go into hot water and you can be there for like three, four hours just doing that. Um, and it's it's amazing. So highly recommend. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And I, I just love that you're also talking about Asian Pacific Islander communities, API communities and how these baths are part of culture and probably go back centuries, right? In community that this is one of these um, community defined practices that research is starting to show us has this impact. That's why our families and communities have been doing them for centuries. The same thing happens 
for people who do sweat lodges from indigenous ancestries. We're starting to see in research that the, it has to do with a variety of different parts of the sweat lodge ceremony, but it involves um, significant heat um, and moisture as well as singing and um, ceremony. Um, and we're starting to see that things like depression are impacted in a positive way by sweat lodges. And the nice thing, sweat lodges don't have the side effects that antidepressants or other medications oftentimes come with. But as you mentioned, Ragni, it is really important to know if people have, for example, are living with cardiac challenges or if they tend to pass out easily, you have to be really careful, of course, with a significant change in temperature um, and be considerate of things like driving. Um, but with, with medical um, approval from doctors, it can be a really great thing. And on that website, um, Dr. Le, um, Ursula Whiteside also talks about if you don't have a bath that you can jump into, you can just take a large bo um, bowl of wa really cold water. She even puts ice in it and she submerges her face for 30 seconds and then comes up for 30 seconds and then submerges again for 30 seconds and comes out for 30 seconds. That in and of itself can do the trick as well, or even taking a really cold bag of peas or ice. You wouldn't want to put it directly in your skin. You want to have some kind of a cloth in between the two, but putting something really cold on the back of the neck also can, can um, cause that dive reflex to happen. Pretty incredible what our bodies and our minds can do. Focusing a little bit on the mind, and now we're going to the cognitive behavioral therapy side of the house. So this is from the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. This is out of Veterans Affairs Hospital. These are helpful thinking tables during the COVID-19 outbreak. So you can look just like, for example, on this coping side. So the common unhelpful automatic thought is something like, I should be coping better. The next um, column over says how you might be feeling if you have that thought, helpless, useless, scared. An alternative helpful thought would be, you know what, I got here today, so I must be coping a bit. Or talking to a friend, mentor, or counselor might help me cope better. Or most people would have trouble in a situation like this. If you have that alternative thought, then it can bring up these alternative feelings like a little less scared, more hopeful, less helpless, stronger, capable, open to getting support or help. So whether we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive processing therapy for trauma, this cognitive shift is really important. And so these um, tables, and there are others that relate specifically to COVID-19 that also might be helpful. Back to you, Ragni. These are some resources on supporting youth mental health, um, just shifting into focusing on specific communities. They require specific resources. Um, you know, all individuals and diverse communities from ages to um, and the cities always need their own like um, specific ways of coping of stress releases. Um, and these are um, different guides and uh, resources that you can use for your clients or you can use as a family member or even for yourself. Um, I feel like um, some of the more important ones are on how to like actually help um, other people actually find strategies and develop a plan to um, support a youth. One of them, one of the family guides actually um, has um, symptoms that you can specifically see in youth um, that they have like this specific way of showing what they're going through um, and then and how what, what strategies you can use depending on the symptoms um, and where you can go from there and how what resources or what people you can call for. Um, and then how to even get help your, your youth get more involved with more um, high school or college like peer support um, um, clubs and peer support groups to really help them um, kind of feel like they're more, more belong in their own community, find um, like, you know, a great way of, you know, we just talked about mood management to get, get hugs and to be around the people that you really care and love about. And it's really great for you to have that support because that's where that at that age you that's their commonness is that they're trying to find their own identity they're trying to find their own ways of like being a part of this world you know going into adulthood 
So a lot of uh, great ways to do that is to have commonalities in peers and being around peers who really understand and care for them. Um, there is a back to school webinar and supporting youth mental health um, webinar that we did as a, as a town hall that we did with California Department of Education. Um, her name was Monica. I'm not going to be able to say the last name because I always do a horrible job pronouncing her beautiful last name. Um, that's the third um, bullet point right here. Um, it's a video and she really goes over on how you can find the symptoms in the youth and how, um, how to actually give like strategies and tips. And she has these really unique resources that she talks about um, that really has helps the youth kind of be where they need to go and how to really like meet them where they're at. Um, because I feel like as adults, we always have this notion of knowing better, we lived a longer life, things like that. But, you know, the youth might be experiencing something completely different in an entirely different generation. Mm -hmm. So um, I think these guides will really help, um, you know, all, the, all yourselves and then clients and your family members really work towards making sure that the youth are getting the resources they specifically need. And I'm highly emphasizing that what they want. So sometimes it's as simple as asking, like, you know, if you don't want to talk to me, is there someone I can get you to so you can talk to them? Because they might not feel comfortable talking to you. And sometimes it's as simple as like, what do you need? You know, what what do you really need um in in your like life right now? Cause I grew up as a youth being told that I can't have problems because I'm a young person, you know, and stuff. That's how I grew up. So I lived my life like that. And I realized that no matter what age you're at, even two-year-olds cry about not having food. That's a stressful thing to go through. <laughs> Imagine trying to do that in your 20s and 30s, not having food. That's sad and stressful. So regardless of what age you're at, it's really making sure that, that we go to where they are and what they need best. So these resources will help you strategize and figure out a way to build a plan and skills for yourself to reach youth. Going even further into younger children, how to help children cope with holiday stress. So some of the things that we can do specifically around the holidays are making sure that we actually discuss plans with children in advance. We invite children to help in the decision-making process if there are decisions to be made. Prolonged uncertainty and constantly changing plans or last minute decisions can all increase stress for young people, especially if they feel like they don't have any control over what is happening or not happening. It's recommended that we don't over schedule. Kids can get easily burned out, overtired and cranky. So the more that we provide quiet downtime to, for them, like listening to music, walking in the woods or reading a book and maintaining sleep can really help them to tolerate any changes in plans or just the excitement of the holidays themselves. Um, just as Rogany was talking about, it's important to let kids be honest about their feelings and ask them to define what's going on for them. We don't want to force them to act happy or excited if they're feeling quiet or down. It's really important that we don't promise things that we can't produce. So for example, that a parent will be home in time for the holidays if the decision is really out of the other parent's control or um, in the world of COVID saying that, oh, this person will definitely be home from the hospital. If we don't actually know, it's important for children that we don't make promises that we can't keep. It's recommended that we, as much as possible, maintain family traditions, even if a parent is absent. So going back to this idea of a parent maybe being in the military overseas, traditions can be grounding. And letting kids know that even though some things have changed, other things have remained and will stay the same can be very helpful. It's important to try not to compensate for an extra for an absent parent with extra gifts or toys. It doesn't work. What kids really want is time, attention, and reassurance. And it's also really important that we take time to care for ourselves that we try to avoid getting overloaded with obligations. And if we feel stressed as adults, it's important to increase the pressure and uh, to realize that when we feel stress, our stress oftentimes increases the pressure and tension for our children. They feel it. 
And finally, it's really helpful to laugh as much and as often as possible. So here's a chart that's about positive parenting in pandemic times, but it also can be especially helpful during the holidays. And what it invites parents or child care providers of whomever um, or supportive people to do is to every day ask, have I hugged the child for today for no reason? Have I helped the child clean their room? Or have I taken a calming breath before talking to the child? Have I played a board game with the kid or had fun in some other way? Have I apologized when I got upset? Have I showed grace to the child when they got upset? Did something silly, did I do something silly just to make my kid laugh? And did I do something just for me? Because when I am not calm, neither is my child. These are really simple things. Most of them don't require any money and really only take a matter of seconds or minutes to do. Ah, this is a letter from my son. And you'll notice what he says, bad hand, you know, spelling and everything aside. He says, you work so hard. You're the best. I like when you make me laugh. Everybody, the only reason why I'm sharing this to you, by the way, like I am not a perfect parent at all. Like this blew me away because I like I work too much. What surprised me and the reason why I'm sharing with you is that he said, you make me laugh. When he gave this to me, I was shocked. I was like, when was the last time that I made this kid laugh? And then when I found that positive parenting chart, I was like, oh my gosh, this is such a good example of how real that chart is that what matters to children, those are the things that they remember. Are we laughing with them? Are we hugging them? Are we helping them to experience the full range of emotions when they have them? So if the kid's upset, we're not trying to change it. We're just being present and letting them know that we are a safe person for them to experience all of that feeling with. So we've got um, some self-care to talk about here. The first section are resources for mental health providers. There are virtual support groups because there's still so much that is um, not available in brick and mortar with social distancing and COVID and everything. And so we've got virtual support groups that people can access online by phone. There are also um, COVID-19 and other stress management apps. So these are great. And many of them are actually no cost. You put them on your phone and you have access to them anywhere, anytime. Um, and then there are a variety of socially distanced suicide prevention. I just wanna bring us back to that early thought that we shared, the research that says that during the holidays, we actually see a decrease in suicidal behavior. This is when we see an increase in substance use. But following the holidays is when we see a rebound in that suicidality. So it is really important to have these resources on hand and to share them with our clients, even if right now they're not feeling like they're in experiencing a suicidal crisis. It's really important um, um, also to have these crisis lines and warm lines, suicide risk assessments, um, and a variety of other resources. And I will just ask Angela if you will quickly kind of roll, scroll through these really quickly here. Just want to highlight as we go down to these virtual support groups that we've really um, tried to make sure that we have resources that are for diverse communities and for diverse um, needs as well. So there are 12 step fellowships, there's self help groups um, for LGBTQ people and Native American communities, and a wide variety of resources that, um, again, are created by and for different communities that are oftentimes historically underrepresented um, in the resources that we provide, but overrepresented in terms of health disparities. Just want to remind you again that Cal Hope is a great place to send clients who are looking for basic needs. They have an incredible list of resources specifically on this topic of basic needs. You don't have to be an expert on basic needs. Cal Hope is there exactly for that reason. Um, so this is a great place to call. Am I correct? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, people can receive support regarding COVID-19, wildfires, other emergency basic needs. Is there anything else that you would want to say in like two sentences, Ragini, to describe CalHOPE to people? 
Um, it's just uh, actual peers who are providing um, crisis um, services, as well as just basic mental health and emotional support for pretty much anything related to COVID and wildfire, but also just mental and behavioral health as well. And last but not least, we really hope that you will stay in touch with us by going to our website, send us an email, you can connect with us over social media or by uh, dropping us a phone call. And if you don't receive the newsletter, please do um, sign up for it. If your colleagues don't receive our newsletter, please share it with them as well.